last program, I talked about non-Euclidean geometry. In fact, I talked about two types of non-Euclidean geometry. They were discovered by a Jesuit priest back in the 16th century who couldn't believe his own conclusions. And because he couldn't believe his own conclusions, he published a book in which he denounced all of the things which he had proved. And the title of the book was Euclid Vindicated from All Error. It wasn't until the 19th century that his conclusions were finally restored to the prominence that they deserve. He had, in fact, discovered two brand new types of geometry without even realizing it. I'm just going to briefly refer to these geometries and then tell you how there were hints way back in Renaissance times that these types of geometries were perfectly sensible. The two types of geometries that we're referring to, what the first one is called hyperbolic geometry, and I have a drawing of it here in front of me. In hyperbolic geometry, we have actually two different parallels, one going to the right and one going to the left. And in between these two parallels, if you crisscross them, there are an infinite number of other lines which will never intersect the line at the bottom. These are called ultra parallels. When the monk, the, the Jesuit monk Zachary, saw this result, he concluded that it was absurd and refused to credit it. We now know that far from being absurd, this result is typical of many types of curved surfaces which have what is called negative curvature, meaning a saddle type of curvature. Now, the other type of geometry which uh, Zachary discovered was called elliptic geometry. And again, he decided that this type of geometry was absurd because the conclusions that he drew were that if you took a line and a whole bunch of perpendiculars to that line, they would all converge to a single point. Once again, he concluded that this was absurd and consequently he renounced it. We now know, of course, that this type of geometry is perfectly sensible if it's interpreted on a surface of positive curvature, such as a ball, uh, or as a mathematician calls it, a sphere. There is, however, one problem which I must refer to, and that is the following problem. On a sphere, the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line as we normally understand it, but rather a great circle. This is a circle which has a center identical with the center of the sphere. There is a problem. If I take two great circles and intersect them, they do not intersect in a single point. Now, what's wrong with that? The problem is that lines are supposed to intersect in single points. Here I have two points of intersection. It was this obstacle that prevented Zachary and many other mathematicians from recognizing that this could be a legitimate type of geometry. But in the late 19th century, a mathematician named Riemann uh, resolved this problem by pointing out that not only must we reinterpret the word line to mean a geodesic or a great circle, which is the shortest distance between two points, but we also have to reinterpret the word point. Instead of talking about a point, we should talk about diameters of the sphere. Each diameter of the sphere has two opposite points. So if we reinterpret the word point to mean diameter, we can then say two lines intersect in a single point. Translation, two great circles intersect in a single diameter. And with this reinterpretation of the word line and with this reinterpretation of the word point, all of the conclusions of Euclidean geometry are true. The only thing which is not true is having to do with parallel lines. There are no parallel lines in this geometry. This conclusion is less than 100 years old. And as we know, it has revolutionized physics. Albert Einstein developed his theories of physics based on the premise of non-Euclidean geometry. Whereas Isaac Newton, back in the 17th century, developed his concept of physics based on the um, Euclidean geometry. It is rather ironic that back even before Newton's time, there were a whole number of artists, painters, sculptors, and architects 
who were aware of many aspects of non-Euclidean geometry even before Newton started developing his physical theories. And what I would like to talk about today is projective geometry. This is the type of geometry which was developed as an adjunct to art. You might ask the question, what is the most realistic way of drawing a cube? Now this is a very simple situation and I have a drawing right here. It's called perspective drawing. On the left, I have a cube using ordinary parallel lines. We all know, of course, that the edges of a cube are parallel to each other. However, this cube does not look as realistic as this cube here. If I extend the edges of this cube as such, they appear to meet at a point right there. This point is called the point of perspective. And it corresponds to a point on the horizon. In other words, if you were looking at the cube um, in an open field which was very flat and extended away to the horizon, it would seem to you as if the parallel lines meet at this point on the horizon. There are other points on the horizon. For example, if I take the diagonal of the top face of the cube and extend it, that should be parallel to the diagonal of the bottom face of the cube. Well, these two lines will also meet at the horizon. If I take two more diagonals, the diagonal of the top face going this way and the diagonal of the bottom face going this way, they will also meet at the horizon. And the horizon is now appeared, it now appears as a line. This is called the line at infinity. And artists who were interested in drawing things realistically had to consider the fact that parallel lines do meet they meet at infinity. And this line at infinity plays an extremely important role in realistic drawing. <clears throat> this is a very famous print. Leonardo da Vinci was particularly uh, interested in the concept of perspective. I don't know how well you can see these lines in this reproduction, but the roof uh, has a number of wooden beams that are all running parallel to each other. And you can see, if you look closely, that they seem to be con converging to infinity. Also, these panels on the side wall seem to be converging on both sides, both the left-hand panels and the right-hand panels. On the floor, there are lines. They're a little difficult to see on the television screen. But if you look at a print of The Last Supper, you will see all these lines all converging to a single point. Now, Leonardo was not only a good mathematician, but of course, a good artist. And in order to heighten the drama of this famous painting, he had it arranged in such a manner that all of these lines would converge at a point which is right in the center of Christ's head. And by doing this, he draws the reader's eyes into the painting and focuses you right on the central figure of the painting, who is Christ at the Last Supper. So here we have a combination of geometry and art. Now, you may wonder, <clears throat> when you have, for example, arches which are, which are marching off towards infinity and seeming to converge, you may notice that the openings in the arches appear to get smaller and smaller and smaller as it goes off towards infinity. Question, how do you know how small to make it as you go along? The answer to this question can be found by asking a much simpler question, and that is, how would you draw a checkerboard in perspective? Not only do you want the columns of the checkerboard to meet at infinity, but you also want the diagonals to meet at infinity. So if I start with the main diagonal of the checkerboard, this will tell me where the end of the checkerboard should be, right there. If I now take the next diagonal, since it's parallel to the main diagonal, it should meet at the same point at infinity, and that tells me where the next line of the checkerboard should be. Now if I join this diagonal to the same point at infinity, it tells me where the next line of the checkerboard should be, and so on. This automatically gives you the correct spacing for the various rows of the checkerboard. And you notice that this row here is much wider than these rows back here. I've done this drawing uh, completely for you so that you can see 
how the perspective arrangement works out. So projective geometry is at the time that it was first developed, it was considered as a purely descriptive device. It was a way of describing how reality looks uh, to somebody who isn't able to walk a distance and see what is going on. Um, there's a little cartoon which illustrates this rather well. Here we have two characters from the famous cartoon stri strip uh, uh, BC. And uh, the character is saying, you see that? They meet. Five clams, please. And in a funk, uh, the other character walks away, only to find that the lines are indeed parallel. When he turns around and looks back, he discovers that they meet at the other end. This underscores the, the, uh, the fact that projective geometry is a geometry in which you, the observer, are nailed in place. You're not allowed to move. You have to look at the universe as it appears to you. You can't walk off to the horizon and see if the lines never meet. You have to take what your, uh, what your eyes indicate to you. Here we have, uh, of course, a very famous situation where the parallel sides of a road appear to meet at infinity. Now, this same principle applies many, many times. In astronomy, for example, you watch the skies and you see meteors coming down. In, in the fall, there are meteor swarms which approach the Earth. And from ancient times, they've observed that these meteors seem to originate in a certain part of the sky and radiate out from this part of the sky. And they used to think that the meteors came from outer space, way, way deep in outer space where the stars are. As a matter of fact, the meteors are not coming from a common point at all. They're di they seem to be diverging because they're traveling along parallel lines. And to our point of view, they appear to be uh, diverging from a common point. Here we have an illustration from an astronomy textbook. In the upper left-hand corner is a configuration known as the head of the dragon. Draco is one of the constellations. And as you look at the meteor swarms in September, you find that the meteors seem to come from the head of the dragon. But as a matter of fact, they are parallel. I would now like to give you a short introduction to some of the aspects of projective geometry that uh, are, I find, most fascinating. I'm, I'm going to take a slightly different point of view, and I'm going to talk about shadows. It turns out that projective geometry is really the geometry of shadows. What I've drawn here, in a very simplistic way, is a flashlight and a ball and the shadow of the ball. Now, the shadow of the ball is a beautiful curve known as an ellipse. And if you draw lines from the tip of the flashlight through the ball down to the ellipse, you can see uh, that actually this beam of light forms a cone. So what you have is you have a cone of light which fits over that ball and casts an elliptical shadow. Here I have another picture in which I have the same ball, but I've moved the flashlight further down, so the flashlight is now even with the top of the ball. And if I now try and draw the same lines that I drew a minute ago, I find that the bottom beam of light is parallel to the plane on which the ball is sitting. And therefore, the point of the ellipse which I had before moves off towards infinity. In other words, this shadow is really infinitely long. If I now drop this line down here, I get the tip of the curve, which is known as a parabola. Incidentally, you might be interested to know that the point of contact between the ball and its shadow is called the focus. Previously, where the ball touched the shadow, it's called the focus of the ellipse. In this case, where the ball touches the shadow, this is the focus of a parabola. If I continue to move the flashlight still lower and put the flashlight halfway down the ball, then I get still a different curve which is known as a hyperbola. And in this case, the, the beam of light which goes through the top of the, of the ball never meets the plane at all. In fact, if you wanted it to meet the plane, you'd have to extend it backwards, and then you'd have some kind of an imaginary shadow over here. Well, of course, we know that this doesn't really happen. But you would have a second piece if you insisted that every beam of light has got to have a shadow somewhere on that plane. Um, the hyperbola is another very famous curve. Uh, these curves were actually studied hundreds of years before Christ by a mathematician named Apollonius. Apollonius considered 
Apollonius, incidentally, uh, this was about 200 years before Christ. Apollonius uh, followed Euclid. Uh, he studied at the same intellectual center that I discussed last time called Alexandria. And he considered the problem of taking a cone with two naps, as I've indicated there, and slicing that cone with a plane. Now, you see that if you slice the cone um, at a tilted angle, on the right-hand side, you get an ellipse. If you slice it in such a way that the plane is parallel to the edge of the cone, then you get a parabola, which is a curve that opens up wider and wider. And if you slice the cone straight up and down, you get two pieces together called a hyperbola. I have here in front of me uh, another drawing which illustrates the same three curves. Now, you may say, think I'm doing this ad nauseum, but you'll see I think that I have an extra special reason for doing it. Here I have a light. I don't know if you can see that. It's a tiny little light source way up here. And I have a box. And on the face of the box, I have painted a circle. I've outlined it in black. The shadow of this circle is down here. Now, there's several things that you will notice. First of all, we know that the edges of the box are parallel. But the shadows are not parallel. The shadows diverge. So this means that parallel lines don't have to look parallel when you take their shadows. Similarly, a circle is shadowed into an ellipse. And these two lines, which form a kind of an inverted V, also form an inverted V on the ellipse. Move down to the second picture. In this case, I've moved the light source down so that I get a parabolic shadow. Now look at this. It's very interesting. The two lines which previously formed a V now become parallel. So this means that parallel lines can have shadows which are not parallel, and non-parallel lines can have shadows which are parallel. It means that parallelism is a rather meaningless concept. Parallelism doesn't make any sense. What's the point of saying two things are parallel? It's all a matter of appearance. It's all a matter of how you look at it. If I move down still further and get a hyperbolic shadow, you will now see why I like to cast the backward shadow. The backward shadow is to take into account, you, well, let's look at this V again. The shadow of the V now become diverging lines. If I want to find the point of intersection of those two diverging lines, I have to cast them backwards. And if I cast them backwards, then I come to this point down here. And I get a second part of the hyperbola. If I do not cast the shadow backwards, then I lose a great deal of information. Uh, one of the basic principles of mathematics is you do not want to lose information. You would like to have all of the information available. If I want to have all of the information available, I must realize that this circle is actually divided into two pieces. The top half must be shadowed backwards, and the bottom half is shadowed forwards. Now, what is projective geometry? Projective geometry is the geometry that we were just describing. It's the geometry of appearances. It's the geometry of shadows. When we talk about it as the geometry of shadows, we think of a light source radiating light symmetrically and casting shadows. When we look at it in the reverse point of view, we think of light beams coming into the eye of the artist and converging to a single point. So all we're doing is just reversing the direction of the light. If the light goes out, we have shadows. If the light comes in, we have art and perspective. They're really the same phenomenon mathematically. You might ask yourself the following question. What possible laws could there be for such a geometry? How could you possibly prove anything? Well, we have already, if you like, we've proven one thing. And that is that the shadow of any conic section, that's one of those curves, ellipse, parabola, or hyperbola, must be another conic section so that the shadow of a conic section is another conic section. This is expressed by saying that conic sections are equivalent to one another in projective geometry. We also have many other properties of projective geometry, though. There's a famous problem. If you want to drive somebody up the wall, ask them the following question. How do you plant 10 trees in 10 rows with three trees in each row? Turns out to be staggeringly difficult. And you can almost be guaranteed that nobody will figure out how to do it. But there is a way of doing it. And one of the founders of projective geometry was an architect in the Renaissance times called de Sargs. And this theorem, which I've drawn here, is called de Sargs' theorem. 
and it tells you how to do it. <laughs> what I have here are two triangles which are said to be in perspective from this point up here. This is the point of perspectivity for these two triangles. And Desargues theorem is the following, that if two triangles are in perspective from a point, then if you join the corresponding sides, like if I join this base and this base, I get a point. If I join this side and this side, I get this point. And if I join the third side and the third side, I get still a third point. Desargues theorem is that these three points must lie on a straight line. Now that's an amazing theorem. The interesting thing about it is that if it's true, it will be true for any shadow. Because I can take this entire picture and I can cast a shadow and it will still be true, right? Therefore, it doesn't depend upon the specific shape of the triangles. It doesn't even depend upon whether the lines are parallel or not. This point might as well be a point at infinity. These lines might as well be parallel lines. It would still be a true theorem. So uh, this is an example of what's called the theorem of projective geometry. Now, in uh, trying to prove such a theorem, you may ask yourself, how could anybody prove such a thing? I'm going to show you. And you'll find it, I think, uh, quite interesting if you can imagine three dimensions, because this must be seen three-dimensionally. It turns out that it's almost impossible to prove the theorem if you think in terms of flat pictures. But if you think in terms of three dimensions, then it becomes a relatively easy proof. <coughs> now, try to imagine this blue, this triangle here, which I've called A prime, B prime, C prime. Think of this as standing up out of the plane, not being flat in the plane, but standing up so that this whole figure here becomes like a triangular solid, like a prism. You see that? Now, if you look at it from this point of view, I have this entire section here and this entire section here is like two folded pieces of paper. Can you imagine a triangular V-shaped folded piece of paper where this is the, the bend, this is the fold in the paper. And one of these folds, the front fold, contains this triangle and the back fold contains the other triangle. And because we know that two planes have to intersect along a straight line, it's precisely that straight line where the sides intersect to give the points which are collinear. Now, if I extend this side of the triangle down here and this side of the triangle down here, those two sides must intersect along the same edge that the paper is folded along. And that's how you prove to Sarg's theorem. Clever, eh? Now the interesting thing again is that this three-dimensional configuration has a two-dimensional shadow. So the theorem is just as true in two dimensions as it is in three dimensions. Try and prove it in two dimensions. You won't be able to. Um, there are other properties which are quite interesting. Now, I haven't got time to go through this, but this is a drawing which Apollonius did 200 years before Christ. It shows a cone, and it shows a slice which is an ellipse. And what he did 200 years before Christ was to put two balls on top and underneath the ellipse. These two balls touch at two points which are called the two foci. One is a focus, two is foci. These two foci have a very interesting property. If I take the distance from any point on the ellipse and add the distance from one focus and to the other focus, it is always a constant. It's always the same number. If I take this distance plus this distance, it's always the same. Why is that? Well, it turns out, as I've indicated at the top, the distance from point P to the first focus is really the distance from point P to the bottom ball. And that's the same whether it goes across this way or down this way. So PF1 is equal to PQ1. Similarly, the distance from P to F2 is the distance to this other ball. And it's the same whether you go across here or up here. So that means PF2 is equal to PQ2. When you put these facts together, you find out that the sum of the distances to the two foci is actually the same as the distance Q1, Q2, and that's a constant as you go around. It's always the same from the, from the bottom ball to the top ball. Well, you might say, huh, it doesn't sound very practical. I would like to show you a practical consequence. Here I have uh, what is called an elliptical whispering gallery. If you go to the Science Center in Toronto, they do have one of these. It's very interesting. If you stand at one focus and whisper, 
then all of the sounds that you make will converge at the other focus. And somebody standing at this other focus can hear you, just as if you're whispering in their ear, despite the fact that nobody else in the room can hear what you're saying. And this is called a whispering gallery. It's quite, a, quite a, a, uh, an interesting device. If I now take one of these focuses and move it off to infinity, what happens? The ellipse becomes a parabola. And then I have the following interesting fact that the lines are now parallel because they're coming from infinity and they converge at a single point, which is called the focus of the parabola. This is the basis for all of the radio telescopes. They take light from distant stars and focus them at a single point, And it's a parabolic curve that does that. This is also the way in which the headlight of your automobile works. If you put a bulb right there and a reflector around the outside, it will take the beams coming from that bulb and push them out as a parallel beam. And that way, you can get an intense light, a parallel beam, coming out of your automobile headlight. So as you can see, there are practical consequences uh, to these um, projective geometry results. Now, OK, I have one final point that I want to make about this. And then uh, we'll have to wind it up because the program is winding down. It's a fascinating fact that projective geometry, as I've just described it, and I'm going to wait until the next program to explain how this happens. The projective geometry that I just described is the same as the elliptic non-Euclidean geometry that Sachary found back in the 16th century and which was not confirmed until the 19th century by Riemann. They are the, the same geometries identically. I am now going to sign off, and next program, I'll explain what the connection is. See you then. Next program is Higher Dimensions.